Okay, thanks very much. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. And, uh, and I, I just wanted to start off uh, with the big picture. Uh, so as organoid research is currently going, we have a moral imperative to do it. It's not just that it's permissible. I think what you're doing is a fantastic thing. Um, and since Stephen Pinker quoted this uh, statement I made many years ago, I'll, I'll quote it again. Every year you delay research curing a disease that kills 100,000 people per year means you are responsible for those 100,000 deaths, even if you never see them. And it's the same for brain diseases and psychiatric diseases. So, you know, I think it's a good thing what you're doing. Um, so I think currently there are no ethical problems with um, organoid research. However, I want us to zoom back to 20 years ago, because I've been in this field for a long time now, and, and um, in many ways there's nothing new about organoid research. So in 1998, I gave an undergraduate uh, psychology student a project. I said, oh, there's these really cool chimeras around. Why don't you have a look at, at chimeras for a, a project? So this is an example uh, of a, uh, a beefalo. Uh, this is a, a, an example of a cross between a bison and a buffalo. This is a jag lion. These are all slides from 1998, so this is in contemporary research. Um, this is a leopon. Uh, this is a liger, but what really got my sort of attention back in 1998 was this. This is the geep, and the geep was formed by fusing a goat and a sheep embryo. So you just take a goat embryo and a sheep embryo, fuse it together, and you get a new life form. Uh, this is an, a, a baby geep. So it seemed to me at that time possible that you could actually create human, non-human chimeras. So what was science fiction seemed to me, in principle, wouldn't be difficult to fuse a chimp embryo and a human embryo. So I gave this to the student to sort of look at this range of things. And eventually she produced the project and we wrote a paper and we were just after Francoise Bayless produced a paper on the ethics of chimeras in about 2000. You know, I spoke to Doug Melton at Harvard a number of years later. I said, could you actually do this? And he said, yeah, with $6 million, we could create a human chimp chimera. So chimeras are an example of a novel life form uh, of which we're not certain of its moral status. So organoids are essentially an organisation of neurons, but a novel kind of life form. But it's really the tip of an iceberg of creating non-human, human chimeras, gastroloids, which I'll talk about, synthetic embryos, neural computing, brain nets, or artificial intelligence. The question with all of these novel entities are whether they could be conscious and what level of consciousness they have and what their moral status would be. So we've, we've heard, I won't go through the, 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 the science because we've had a wonderful display of it. Um, but I think, it's, I think at this point it's clear that the level of development of organoids, there's no possibility of consciousness or, or moral issues. But if you were to grow organoids to a further stage of development, it may be the case that they become conscious. And indeed, Christoph Koch, or Koch, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, um, is quoted as himself saying, um, because it doesn't have an eye or an ear, it's very unclear what it's going to be conscious of. But in principle, this thing will experience something. When you have these cortical organoids and it gets big and complex enough in its electrical activity, we have to start thinking, is this thing in pain? And to sort of compare this to another debate, many people were very enthusiastic when Adrian Owen found uh, flickers of consciousness in people thought to be in a vegetative state. But uh, a number of us said it could actually be a living hell to be in a minimally conscious state. And likewise, it could be in a living hell, to be a living hell having no sensory input and no mo motor output. So you mentioned the, the children who have been deprived of sensory input and the horrible lives that they have. I guess we don't really know what it would be like to be an advanced organoid without sensory or motor input. It may be extremely unpleasant. And I think this is what Koch is, what Coke is getting at. The idea of a human, a fully developed human brain and an eye appeared in Raoul Dahl's story, William and Mary, where a uh, controlling husband has his brain stored in a vat. 
uh, with just an eye and his wife performs a whole series of actions like smoking and drinking alcohol that he hates constantly in front of him. And again, it's meant to depict a kind of living hell. Um, the key philosophical questions around all of these entities, organoids, human, non-human chimeras, are two. First of all, um, what is of moral significance? What makes moral status? And does that entity have that level of consciousness to confer moral status? So this is Adrian Owen, um, and it's, it's worth noting that researchers working in the field have argued that cerebral organoids couldn't learn uh, or think in the absence of input and output. But however, as people like Koch have suggested, that may not settle the moral question. Uh, this is a slide of uh, another uh, non-human animal. The ethical question is no less difficult. The ethical significance of consciousness and other properties in the cerebral organoid would presumably track their ethical significance in other familiar contexts. Um, but there's no philosophical consensus about whether mere sentience is enough to confer moral status or self-consciousness or rational activity or capacity for moral agency. Uh, so again, this is research uh, which you've already seen. Um, uh, this involved uh, introducing uh, organoids into a, a mouse brain. Uh, and some people have called this process moral humanization. As Madeline was saying, in the case of chimeras, as I'll come to, uh, it would be possible today to create a pig human chimera with a partly pig, partly human brain. And we're often told when this research is being done that we needn't worry because the human, the human neurons won't fully express themselves. This will essentially be a pig. But actually, I don't think there's overwhelming evidence to believe that. So a number of years ago, Tom Beecham asked me to write a contribution to his handbook of animals on chimeras. And I came up with a four stage evaluation for chimeras. And I think the same thing applies to organoids. Now chimeras didn't ev eventually eventuate from uh, fusing uh, or splitting embryos. They arose through a process of blastocyst complementation. Uh, so many, many of you will be familiar with this, but you take say a pig embryo and you knock out the, the cell line that is going to contribute to say the liver. You introduce human embryonic stem cells uh, into that pig embryo. Uh, a chimera is formed, a pig human chimera, except the liver itself is human. That liver could in principle be extracted for liver transplantation. But the brain is going to be chimeric. And we simply don't know what the capacities of that brain are going to be. These are not actual chimeras, these are mock-ups. Um, but what was science fiction now is happening at least with the pig. So the first stage is to decide, and we can talk about chimeras or organoids or genetically modified animals or gastroloids. These are all examples of what you might call genetically modified animals. The first stage in an ethical evaluation is to decide what the, cor what the correct standard of moral status is. And this, of course, is something that we haven't been able to decide in non-human animals. Is species membership relevant? Is mere sentience relevant? Or is higher cortical function functioning relevant? So the first task before we proceed with advanced organoid research or developing pig human chimeras is to decide what's the bar at which we owe that creature uh, concern and respect for its interests. And the second problem is an epistemological problem of deciding whether that new entity crosses that threshold. Um, now, one of the ways of doing that is inferring from structure to function, but as you go up to higher animals, such as the pig-human chimera, it may well be we have to evaluate behaviour before we can evaluate uh, its moral status. It may be you require social environments to fully uh, bring out the capacities of that animal. So one point that I want to make is as we move further along, before we start to experiment on novel entities, we need to perform investigations, scientific investigations, to identify whether that entity has crossed the threshold of moral status. And treatment ought to be according 
to um, the level of moral status. Now, in the case of the, the organoids we've been discussing, the little, little organoids in the, in the jar, these are, clearly, uh, these are clearly at a stage prior to a fetus that could be aborted through a social abortion. So in my, when I last looked at it, consciousness begins in the fetus at around 20 weeks gestation. So prior to 20 weeks, the fetus isn't conscious. Now these organoids are a long way away from a 20 week fetal brain. So if you're to apply a consistent standard to how we treat other human beings, uh, provided the research was done followed by destruction, it could be done until an organoid developed with a level of complexity to a 20 week fetus, ethically. Of course, in the UK, we have a 14 day rule, um, which we can talk about um, afterwards. But, but ethically, I think uh, the principle that we ought to apply that it applies to, to the social practice of abortion. In many cases, it won't be clear what level of consciousness there is and what, uh, and what actually it's like to be a human, non-human, chimeral and advanced organoid. And there I think we ought to err on the side of generosity to accord the highest level of moral status that might be consistent with that novel entity. But again, in the case of current organoid research, it couldn't be any more than a rudimentary embryo or very early human fetus, nothing like a 20 week fetus. So at this point, I don't see any ethical issues in, in organoid research. The second stage of evaluation, I'll pass quickly through these because they're not so relevant to this talk. We need reasons to create novel entities where there are risks of creating something with a moral status. And in the case of blastocyst complementation, it's the problems of the shortage of organs for transplantation, the problems of immunosuppression and so on. And in this case, it's the problem of mental illness or brain disease that we need to understand its development. But you need a justification where there are possibilities that an entity could be capable of consent. Obviously, consent is necessary, but clearly those little blobs can't consent. And of course, there's also an issue increasingly of dual use uh, of, of scientific research, which we don't have time to go into. There are a number of standard objections to creating novel entities, threat to our humanity, forbidden by deontological constraints, we're playing God, a slippery slope. Again, I think there are very good responses to all of these objections. So what about this issue though of moral humanization, creating uh, perhaps human, non-human brain organoid transplants um, that reached a level of cognitive development that were greater than a native animal. So in one of the uh, studies where human organoids were placed into mouse brains, they actually tested the mice for their functional capacity. And they found that they were no better than ungrafted mice on a Barnes maze test. So in the one experiment that's been done, the mouse with a human organoid in its brain doesn't perform any better than a normal mouse. Um, so you might say, well, that's fine. We don't have to worry about putting organoids into, into, into mice. But there are two problems with this. First of all, this only tests one aspect of mouse behavior, specifically spatial learning ability. And secondly, the effects of human cerebral organoid implants might depend on the type, size, and number of cerebral organoids transplanted, the extent of maturation, and the species that receives the graft. So while this is the right way to go, there's going to be a lot more work in terms of that sort of functional testing as we start to um, upscale this sort of research. So indeed, in this study, mice were implanted with an organoid about the size of a lentil but hypothetically, it would be possible to approach the whole scale replacement of an animal's brain through implanting thousands of individual organoids. And that, I think, might begin to raise questions about moral status. Um, let's pass over that. Uh, there's been about four papers in the bioethical literature on the moral issues around organoids, all of them, I think, unsatisfactory. So, I want to pass over what's been said. Um, and so I think that we, we, need, we need a um, principle of, of well, it's the, that's the, the background standard. Um, um, I think we should have, in this case, ethics first, science second. 
So the default should be to assume the highest moral status possible, um, to not assume that, that structure doesn't support some sort of higher function and to evaluate moral status before experimentation. I think the arguments are overwhelming that current organoids don't have any prospect for either consciousness or any form of morally significant consciousness. Now again, I want to zoom out to talk about the wider application. So organoids are just an example of creating novel entities or things you might call nentities. And organoids, chimeras, gastroloids, neural computing, AI and brain nets. And I differ from some of my colleagues in the centre that if something can pass a test such that it appears as if it has moral agency, um, we ought to assume it has moral agency. If something can appear to have consciousness, we ought to grant it consciousness. That's the principle of generosity. Um, but as I reiterate, um, organoid research has a long way to go before it reaches a 20-week fetal brain and its level of um, development. Um, another issue uh, are gastroloids and sy synthetic embryos. So stem cell colonies can, uh, that can begin to develop into early tissue types, including the central nervous system. So researchers have prompted mouse and human pluripotent stem cell colonies to self-organise in ways that recapitulate recapit aspects of embryonic development, including gastrulation, the process by which early tissue types, including the central nervous system, begin to develop. So these have been called gastroloids, embryonic organoids, synthetic embryos, and so on. Um, they recapitulate the development, developmental process rather than an organ, but are nonetheless considered a part of the organoid field. So although gas, um, gastroloids have been developed um, that differ from natural embryos in these respects, um, it's plausible that researchers will soon be able to create structures that cl very closely resemble human embryos and may even have the capacity to develop into a human being. So even if they never attain the capacity to develop into a human being, they may be able to develop into other morally relevant, uh, they may be able to develop other morally relevant activity, including neural activity. So the key concern with gastroloids is that it's unclear at what point these entities should be regarded as a form of, em a form of human embryo. So at the moment, current research has been able to sidestep the 14-day embryo research rule. Um, but plausibly, insofar as gastroloids are functionally akin to human embryos, whatever restrictions are meant to apply to embryos or to apply to them. Um, but nonetheless, this raises the issue of what is morally significant. The 14-day rule was a compromise to allow embryo research to occur. It's the point at which the primitive streak, the very beginning of the nervous system, emerges. There's no possibility of consciousness at that point. It's also the point at which twinning supposedly is no longer possible. Neither of these points are particularly morally significant. So if you want to ask what is of moral significance, ask when does our life end in a morally significant way? We now have introduced a concept of brain death for the purposes of uh, getting people off ventilators and providing organs for transplantation. That was the actual rationale in 1967. Um, many people, myself included, think our lives end not when our brains are dead, but when we're permanently unconscious. So if that's when our life ceases, our life begins in a morally significant point only when consciousness begins, and that's not until 20 weeks of gestation. Um, the last point I want to make is that we, many people believe that if we can find some level of consciousness in organoids or in uh, any other novel life form that derives from human tissue, that that confers special significance to it. But all of the lab animals that we experiment on are conscious and probably much more highly conscious than any organoid that we're going to develop. Um, and I don't believe that we ought to give human organoids special protection over non-human animals. So there's going to be a, an interesting question, if organoids ever do become consciousness, whether that does really preclude research on them. Because after all, there are 24 billion animals in the world used for farming and research, uh, and we are very prepared to use them for our purposes. So the mere finding of consciousness in an organoid might not be enough to preclude experimentation on it.
So to finish, I think there's nothing ethically significant about current research. It's only as this research advances to a point where it's possible that consciousness occurs, but even that doesn't answer the question of what treatment is appropriate for that entity. And for that, we have to answer the question of what is moral status, something that society has not been able to answer so far. Thank you.